We're good to go. Just get a confirmation. Is it on? Okay. Did you go on the schedule thing? The one that was scheduled, yeah. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen was salatu was salam ala abdillahi wa rasulih nabiyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal and His mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us to gather together in a virtual way and to share uh, this uh, discussion with you as part of the Month of Mercy online conference which is being hosted and organized by the Islamic Information Center in association with Jam'iyyat Dar al-Bir and the topic that we're going to be dealing with inshallah is Ramadan an opportunity for change so I want to start with the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about the month of Ramadan Allah Azza wa Jal said شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about this month of Ramadan, the month in which the Quran was revealed. And it's enough of a, an ayah, a sign from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal and the mercy that exists within this month, that it is the month in which Allah Jalla fi Ula revealed the Quran and made it a distinguishing guidance that guides between the difference between the right and the wrong the truth and the falsehood and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this month a month of ease and he made the sharia a sharia of ease and he also made it a training program for us as Muslims to correct ourselves and to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah Azza wa Jal made it an opportunity for change and an opportunity to improve ourselves. Al Imam Muslim in his Sahih narrated from the hadith of Abi Hurairah, and the hadith is also narrated in Al Bukhari, also. The hadith is muttafaqun alayhi in the Bukhari and Muslim, in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Ida ja'a Ramadan futtihat abwabu al Jannah. وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَصُفِّدَتْ الشَّيَاطِينَ When the month of Ramadan comes, the gates of Jannah are open and the gates of the fire are locked and the shayateen are chained, the devils are chained. And this relates to both the general theme of the conference but it also relates to the topic that we're dealing with specifically about change. First of all, it relates to the topic of mercy in the sense that from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal is that the, the doors of Jannah are open this month and that the doors of al jahim the doors of Jahannam, are closed and that the shayateen are chained. This is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it affords us an opportunity for change. It facilitates for us to be able to change. Because the conditions are present in order to make it easy for us to change. And maybe not many people think of it, but Ramadan is a month of ease. Maybe people think of it as a difficult month because you're fasting. And sometimes the fasting is hard. But ultimately, the ease that Allah places in Ramadan for the mu'min, for the believer, to be able to make significant changes, this is something that it can't be ignored. 
And from this ease is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the doors of Jannah. And from this ease is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed the doors of Jahannam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chained the shayateen. In some of the narrations it indicates that the marada, the, 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 the most stubborn among the shayateen are chained. And perhaps this indicates that the effect of the shaitan is lessened in Ramadan. It doesn't mean that the shaitan is completely absent or some of the smaller shayateen or the shayateen from the ins, from, the, from man are absent but it indicates to us that the effect of the shaitan is limited and lessened and reduced in this month of Ramadan. So every condition is there for us to be able to make changes. The doors of Jannah are open. The doors of Jahannam are closed. The shaitan's influence is massively reduced. And that gives us every opportunity for us to be able to make changes. In a hadith, uh, which is narrated in Jami' al-Tirmidhi and in Sunan al-Nasai with a similar wording but with, an, with some additions to it and this is from the hadith of the hadith of Utbah uh, from the hadith of uh, of uh, Utbah Ibn Farqad radiallahu anhu that he mentioned, he said, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يقول. I heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say, تُفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَتُغَلُّ فِيهِ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَيُنَادِ مُنَادٍ كُلَّ لَيْلَةِ يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلِ In some narrations, يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلِ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ Aqsir, and in other ones, Ya baghi al khair halummah, wa ya baghi al sharr aqsir. The beginning of the hadith is similar to the hadith of Abi Hurairah that we heard that the doors of Jannah are open, and the doors of Jahannam are closed, and the shayateen are chained, and every night a caller calls out, Ya baghi al khairi aqbil. O doer of good, proceed. And O doer of evil, desist. Subhanallah. This is the month in which Allah Azza wa Jal facilitates for people to do good. Perhaps a person who wasn't doing that good before the month of Ramadan, but is said in the month of Ramadan, Ya baghi al khayri aqbil. O doer of good, Come forward. وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ أَقْصِرْ An doer of evil, desist and reduce and slow down and stop. And ultimately that gives us an opportunity as well. It gives us an opportunity to proceed in doing good. Doing good has been made and facilitated for us and made easy and made easy for us. And it's a month in which Allah Azza wa Jal gives us many opportunities for forgiveness. And ultimately making a change is all about starting by purifying the heart and asking Allah for his forgiveness. And then from there building up with the good deeds, the obligatory deeds and the voluntary deeds. This is a month where there are many opportunities for forgiveness. We know from a hadith that is narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the hadith of Abi Hurairah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam climbed a mimbar فَقَالَ آمين, آمين, آمين. He said Ameen, Ameen, Ameen قِيلَ لَهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا كُنْتَ تَصْنَعُ هَذَا O Messenger of Allah, you didn't used to do this before فقال, قَالَ لِي جِبْرِيل رَغِمَ أَنْفُ عَبْدٍ أَدْرَكَ أَبَوَيْهِ أَوْ أَحَدَهُمَا 
لم يدخله الجنة قلت آمين ثم قال رغم أنف عبد دخل عليه رمضان لم يغفر له فقلت آمين ثم قال رغم أنف امرئ رغم أنف امرئ ذكرت عنده فلم يصلي عليك فقلت آمين He said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam climbed a member and he said Ameen, Ameen, Ameen and they said to him, O Messenger of Allah, you never used to do that before. He said, Jibreel said to me, may the person be wretched whose he, 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 one of his parents or both of his parents and he, he, he's alive to serve one of his parents or both of his parents and that doesn't make him enter Jannah and he doesn't enter Jannah because of how he was to his parents and I said Ameen he said may the one be wretched the one who Ramadan comes to them and they're not forgiven and I, the Prophet said I said Ameen he said wretched is the one may the one يعني رغم أنف may he be disgraced the one who you are mentioned i.e. the Prophet is mentioned and you don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet said Ameen. The reason I brought this hadith is that if uh, Jibreel made dua for the person to be wretched and to be ruined, and in some narrations he said, Allah, may Allah make him far away, may Allah cast him far away, if he doesn't get forgiven in the month of Ramadan. What does that tell you about the month of Ramadan? It tells you that the opportunities to, for forgiveness are not hard to find. And the opportunities for change are not hard to find. Otherwise, there would not have been this dua made for the one that doesn't take, against the one that doesn't take the opportunity. Inshallah, you're following me on that. What I'm saying is that if Jibreel and the Prophet Sallallahu they made dua against the person who reaches the end of Ramadan and hasn't been forgiven, then that must mean that Ramadan is full of opportunities for forgiveness. And forgiveness is the first step in making a serious and lasting change in ourselves. The first step is a tawbah. And that's why Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he mentioned haqiqatu tawbah. It is the reality of tawbah is to feel regret over what you have done. Fil madi, to feel regret for what you did, uh, what you did in the past, to feel regret for what you did in the past. Nedmu ala ma waqa'a minhu fil madi. Feel regret for what happened in the past. And to stop doing it in the present. And to make an intention. To make an intention and to be determined. That he's not going to come back to it in the future. So this is the beginning, as we said. The opportunities for istighfar in Ramadan. Those are the opportunities that we can take to start this change, inshaAllah ta'ala. And from the ahadith, in this regard, and the opportunities that we have in this regard, is what is mentioned in the hadith as we said, يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ أَقْصِرْ وَلِلَّهِ أُتَقَاءُ مِنَ النَّارِ وَذَلِكَ كُلُّ لَيْلَةِ وَذَلِكَ كُلَّ لَيْلَةِ That Allah Azza wa Jal has people that He frees from the hellfire every single night. Every single night from the month of Ramadan, Allah has people that He fears, that He frees, sorry, people that He frees from the hellfire. People that He frees from the hellfire. So there are opportunities that are abundant in Ramadan and chances to change that are abundant in the month of Ramadan. And now we need to start looking at what these opportunities are and how we should take advantage of them. The first thing we need to understand is that the month of Ramadan is there to develop a taqwa in us. 
Allah Azza wa Jal said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been made obligatory for you as it was made obligatory for those who came before you so that you might achieve a taqwa. So the process of fasting, the action of fasting every day is one that develops within us a taqwa. It develops within us a taqwa. So we have to ask ourselves, what is this taqwa that is developed or develops within us by the permission of Allah during the fasting of Ramadan? And how is it that it motivates us and helps us to change and make changes? So from this, is that a taqwa is to shield yourself or to place a barrier or a shield between you and between the anger of Allah and his curse, and his punishment and the hellfire. To put a barrier between you and between the curse of Allah, his anger, his punishment and the hellfire. By doing as much as you can from the things that Allah commanded you to do, and by keeping away from as many things as you can that Allah commanded you to keep away from. So Ramadan increases you in taqwa. That means it increases you in good deeds and it decreases you in sins. It, makes you, it gives you an increase in doing good deeds and a decrease in doing sins. And that is the purpose for which Allah Azza wa Jal legislated fasting. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may develop a taqwa, you may be from the people of taqwa. So Ramadan is a training program that makes it easy for us to do good deeds and it makes it easy for us to keep away from sins. How is it that fasting makes it easy for us to do good deeds and how is it that fasting makes it easy for us to keep away from sins? One of the ways, and I'm not saying this is the only way, is that when you restrict your desires, even if those desires are permissible, whether that be restricting the desire for food and drink or restricting the desire for intimacy or any of the other things that we restrict ourselves from during the day in Ramadan, those restrictions, restricting yourself, it helps you to control your nafs. It gives you a degree of self-control. And that same self-control, you can apply it to make changes by helping you to keep away from the haram. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, He told us, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى that whoever fears standing in front of his Lord and prevents his soul from its desires, Jannah will be his destination. Jannah will be his destination. And that comes from what it comes from? Preventing the soul from its desires. So since Ramadan develops within you an ability to control because you're keeping away from some permissible things, you're keeping away from some things that are halal for you, like food and drink and so on. And so Ramadan allows you and gives you the ability by the permission of Allah to be able to have more control over your nafs. And then the situation in Ramadan from the chaining of the shayateen and the reduction of evil and the increase of good, it also facilitates for you to make changes and helps for you to be able to, to make changes. And also from the things which helps you in, in the month of Ramadan is that the rewards and the good deeds are multiplied. And from those things which help you in the month of Ramadan is that all of the Muslims are coming together to do good. And so it's easier to do good when you're surrounded by people doing good. And so when you're surrounded by the Muslims who are doing good, Everyone's praying more, everyone's reading Qur'an more, everyone's fasting, everyone's giving more charity, then it facilitates and it helps you to be able to do good as well. But Ramadan really is a training program. And what that means is that it is there to train you. It's not 
the final step in your journey or the final stage in your journey. Ultimately, when Ramadan finishes, you have to keep that change going. And that's part of sincerity, part of ikhlas and niyyah lillahi azza wa jalla. And we were just talking today, as I was releasing today my tafsir class, we we're talking about the tafsir of Surah Al-Sharh, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, in which Allah azza wa jalla said, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish one act of worship, go right into the next act of worship. When you finish an act of worship, go right into the, another act of worship. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ فَانْصَبْ فِي أُخْرَى When you've start, finished with an ibadah, you go right into another ibadah. And that's ultimately how we should be after the month of Ramadan. It should be the case that we have trained ourselves to have more control over our nafs. We've benefited from the reduced influence of the shaitan. We've benefited from the collective desire of the Muslims to do good and everyone doing good around us. And we've benefited from the opportunities for forgiveness and, and goodness that come in this month. And then those things, we take them and we, we take them on our journey throughout the rest of the year. We carry them with us on our journey throughout the rest of the year until the next Ramadan comes again. And we get, we get additional training, we refresh our training, renew our training. So this is an opportunity for everyone to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this we should mention or we should speak about how does a person, how does a person begin this journey of making a change in Ramadan or even outside of Ramadan? How uh, does a person make this change? How does a person actually go about changing or what are the things that a person should give that attention to? So for this we have a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he explains how to get near to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala how to become near to Allah and that really ultimately that's what we need to that's what we we need to kind of uh, we need to kind of uh, sort of focus upon So Al-Bukhari narrates from the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu an that, he's, that, he, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna Allah ta'ala qal, Allah the Exalted said, Man aada li waliyan faqad aadhantuhu bil harp. Whoever shows enmity to a close, beloved worshipper of mine, a close slave of mine, whoever shows an enmity to them, I have declared war upon him. وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبْ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ And my servant never came close to me with anything more beloved to me than what I made obligatory for him. So here we're going to stop. We're going to take our first point. We mentioned, this is really our second point because we mentioned al-istighfar and al-tawbah. This is the beginning. The beginning of change is al-istighfar wa tawbah wal-ruju' wal-inaba to go back to Allah, to turn back to Allah, to make tawbah, to ask Allah's forgiveness. This is the beginning of change. And Ramadan offers so many opportunities like the fact that Allah has utaqa, Allah has people that He frees from the fire every night. And in some of the narrations it mentions every one of them has da'watun mustajabah, a dua that is answered. And the opportunities for asking Allah's forgiveness are many in Ramadan. So we said that asking forgiveness and purifying our heart and clearing out our heart from the sins and disobedience that's the, that's the very beginning. So now we come to our second point. وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ That my servant never came close to me with anything more beloved to me than what I made obligatory for him. So we have to start with the obligatory deeds. We don't start with the, 
you know, some of the voluntary deeds. We start with the obligatory deeds. That's how we start making a change. With istighfar, asking Allah's forgiveness, and by carrying out and following out or following upon and carrying out the obligatory deeds. When we do that, we get a certain nearness to Allah. وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي We become near to Allah. We start our journey of nearness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make istighfar, we ask Allah's forgiveness, and then we continue on our journey by making sure that we are doing the obligatory deeds. And the obligatory deeds, there are actually two uh, elements to this. There are two elements to this. One is that there is doing the things that Allah has commanded you to do. And the other one is keeping away from the things which Allah has prohibited you from doing. And both of those are from the fard. They're from the fard. The fard that you have to do and what is fard upon you to leave. So that's where we begin. And we begin with al-aham fal-muhim. The most important, and then the next important, and the next important. So when we're looking to make a change, we started with istighfar. We started with asking Allah's forgiveness and istighfar. And when we asked Allah's forgiveness and we made istighfar and we tried to turn back to Allah, we felt sorry for what we did, and we stopped doing it, and we tried to make an intention that we're not going to do it again. And then after that, we started to do the obligatory deeds. And the obligatory deeds that we started to do, we looked at the most important and then the most important. And we looked at the things that Allah commanded us to give importance to before other things. And what's most important? What's the most important thing? So we look at, for example, our worship of Allah Azza wa Jal alone and with no partner. And we look at our prayers, our obligatory prayers, the five obligatory prayers, which are the most important of all of the things that a person can do. And then we look at the next important and the next important and the next important until we have started to do the obligatory deeds. And we don't just look at the things that we have to do, we also look at the things that we have to keep away from as well. So we look at getting rid of the biggest sins, and then the next one, and then the next one. And when we've done that, we have started on our journey. We've started on our journey, and we've come near to Allah a certain extent. But now we come to the next part, and this is very relevant to the month of Ramadan. The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, as is narrated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهِ That my servant continues to do voluntary deeds until he reaches the level where I love him. That person gains the love of Allah by doing voluntary deeds. Notice here that we have steps and levels. We started with al-istighfar and at tawbah turning to Allah and cleaning our hearts and preparing our hearts. Then we came to what was the next stage we came to, the next place or level that we came to. We came to looking at the obligatory deeds, keeping away from the haram. And then when we, we started to find some regularity in that, and it doesn't mean that I have to do every obligatory deed before I look at any voluntary deed. Each action is going to be at different stages. There's some actions where maybe I'm falling short and I, I need to just look at the obligatory aspect of it. There's some where maybe I've, I'm a bit better and I'm looking at the voluntary aspects now. So each action is given individual consideration. And each action I'm looking at trying to push myself from the obligatory level to the voluntary level as much as possible. 
and look at all of the major actions that a Muslim does and how these are facilitated to reach voluntary, the voluntary level in Ramadan. So based on this, وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهِ that the servant continues to come near to Allah with the nawafil until Allah loves them. For example, look at the prayer. In Ramadan, the facility is there, the ease is there to be able to pray the whole night. How can you pray the whole night? By starting with the imam and finishing with the imam. How can you start with the imam when we're in lockdown can't go to the masjid for example then in this case you have a small jama'ah in your house where if you can if you're able you have a small jama'ah in your house after salat al-isha you start with the imam and you finish with the imam and it's written for you that you prayed the whole night that's in addition to your obligatory fajr and dhuhr and asr and maghrib and isha now you went to the level of the voluntary deeds and in the prayer. You're already doing the obligatory deeds in the fasting in Ramadan and you're going to make an intention that when Ramadan finishes, you're going to do some voluntary fasts. Voluntary fasts could be fasting a Monday or a Thursday and a Thursday, could be fasting three days of the month, Ayyamul Bid, the 13th and 14th and 15th of the Islamic calendar every month. It could be fasting, whatever Allah makes it easy for you to fast. And that's building on the obligatory. You did the obligatory in Ramadan, Psalm Ramadan, and then you built up. Look at the opportunities for charity. The opportunities for, for charity. And in this, it's narrated that the Prophet wasallam, he was at his most generous in the month of Ramadan. He was most generous in the month of Ramadan when Jibreel would meet him and he would revise with him the Quran. He would revise with him the Quran. He was most generous as in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He was the most ajwad mayakun, the most generous that he would be in the month of Ramadan. Now many people give their zakah in this month and of course zakah is a bit of a complicated one. So you, you can give it early but you can't give it late. But if a person gives it early in the month of Ramadan, again, you're giving your zakat, that's your obligation. And now in Ramadan, you have opportunities for the voluntary deeds. You have opportunities for voluntary sadaqah. And the Prophet ﷺ was at his most generous, his most generous, he was in the month of Ramadan. He was at his most generous in the month of Ramadan. When Jibreel would meet him and he would revise, the Quran and it's mentioned that he would be more generous than a rih al mursala than the wind that brings the rain, that brings the clouds and brings the rain. And meaning that the generosity of the Prophet would be wide, encompassing many people, and it would be prolific. He would be extremely, extremely generous in the month of Ramadan. So this is just another example. This is another example of how we have opportunities for fara'id, obligatory deeds, and then those opportunities lead us to the voluntary deeds. And that brings us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the love of Allah azza wa jal, like is mentioned at the end of the hadith, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلَنِي لَعُطِيَنَّهِ if that person asks me, makes dua to me, I will give him what he asks for. And if he seeks refuge with me, I will give him refuge. And all of that comes from what? Building upon the obligatory deeds and building up to the voluntary deeds. And even within Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ was not the same. So in the last 10 days of Ramadan, it is narrated from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, that she said about the Prophet Sallallahu In some narrations it said He would work hard 
and he would tighten his belt, meaning he would increase in his dedication, in his worship, in his efforts. He would increase in it. And he would make his night come to life, meaning he would pray all of his night. And he would wake up his family for the prayers. So here, again, even within Ramadan, you're talking about that same thing. You build a level. You build yourself a base in the first 10 days, the second 10 days. And when the last 10 days come, you push it even further. You work even harder. You push yourself even further. You train yourself even more so that you can get even more out of this month of Ramadan. And of course, no doubt, the within the last 10 days, the seeking out of Laylatul Qadr and the fact that Laylatul Qadr, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr is better than a thousand months. So subhanAllah, look at the opportunities that you have right there. The opportunities to get over 83 years of worship in a single night. But here's the thing, we don't know which night it is. We don't have a clear evidence for it being the 27th night, even though the people come out on the 27th night as though there is no other night. But we don't have an evidence for that. Not an evidence to single it out. And we don't have an evidence... Although we know that it's on the odd nights, we have a hadith that measure the odd nights from the beginning of Ramadan and a hadith that measure the odd nights from the end of Ramadan. And if you measure them from the end of Ramadan, it can be that an odd night becomes even and an even night becomes odd. In other words, if the, if the, month, the length of the month changes, all the nights you thought were odd become even and all of the nights you thought were even become Odd. So there are a hadith like that. So that tells us that you can't even guarantee, like some people, go on the odd night and sleep on the even night. Pray on the odd night, sleep on the even night. None of that is worthwhile. What is beneficial is that you, every one of those last 10 nights, you strive for it and you work for it. Because if you catch it, you caught, what did you catch? 83 years and so many months of worship in one single night. And look at what that does to give you a boost, to facilitate for you to change, to help you and, and make it easy for you to be able to be able uh, to change. And Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only needs for you to show that dedication and that desire that you really want to make a change. If you come near to Allah Azza wa Jal by a shibr, by a handspan, then Allah Azza wa Jal comes near to you by a dhira'ah, by the length of your forearm, as is mentioned in the authentic hadith, and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants from you that you show that dedication and that you have that commitment to make that change. And then that change becomes easy for you. And Allah is most forgiving. And that's why on Laylatul Qadr, Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet sallallahu she said, if you th what do you think if I, if I, in wafaqtu, if I get the tawfiq from Allah to pray Laylatul Qadr, ma ad'u, what dua should I make? He said to her, quli, Allahumma innaka afuun, tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. O oh Allah, you are the one who pardons all the time, always forgives and pardons and overlooks. So forgive me, pardon me, overlook my sins. So from this we see that even this concept of istighfar, concept of con so many opportunities for forgiveness, so many opportunities to do the obligatory deeds and build on them with the voluntary deeds. And only what you have to do is to have that dedication and that commitment that you're going to carry it on and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for you in this month to make those changes. And that's because it's a month where the doors of Jannah are open and the doors of Jahannam are closed and the shayateen are chained. 
But I want to highlight and I want to kind of conclude on this point that I wanted to highlight when it comes to making changes in Ramadan. I wanted to conclude on this point that what is very, very important, Wallah, in fact, two things that are, the only two things that are really important. It's number one, sincerity in your intention and number one, that you're following the sunnah of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and you're sticking within that. But as it, as it relates to intention, what I see is that a lot of people, they only intend to make these changes for Ramadan. I pray in Ramadan and they don't have an intention to keep it going after Ramadan. They say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, fast in Ramadan, but they don't have any intention to continue the voluntary fast outside of Ramadan. They say that I'm going to read the Qur'an in Ramadan, the month of the Qur'an. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. But they don't have any intention to read the Qur'an after that. And you see the intentions of the people Yawm al-Eid, on the day of Eid. You see it obvious in front of people. There are people who take the day of Eid as a day to do every kind of haram. All the haram, they've been saving it up. They've been storing it up. Like shayateen who have been chained, they've been chaining themselves and they just can't wait till they get let go. And when they get let go, they plan to go out and do every kind of haram on that day. So that's not the description that we described to you. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish a worship, an act of worship, you start another one. That's not that description. And it's not the description of the person who is sincere to Allah, that they are just storing up the haram. Oh, I can't wait till Eid, I'm going to do this haram and this haram and this haram and this haram. Or the person on the day of Eid, no salah, they don't pray. Or they, don't, they left all the, the voluntary deeds they were doing. All the things, the good that they were doing, they just left it like that on that day. Just let it all go. So this isn't sincere. And this is not what we need to make a lasting change. Rather, I believe the day of Eid is a fundamental day for you. It's a day that distinguishes. It's a faisal, a distinguishing day between the people who really want to make a change and the people who weren't really serious about making a change. Because the people want to make a change فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish an act of worship Go right into the next act of worship فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Finish one Get into the next one And so they take it that the day of Eid Is a time for celebration It's a time for fun It's a day of Akal وشرب, Eating and drinking But it's not a day of disobeying Allah Azzawajal. It's still a day of praying. It's still a day of reciting the Quran. It's still a day of tawbah and istighfar. It's still a day of doing the fara'id and building on with the nawafil, the voluntary deeds. That doesn't stop because Ramadan stopped. And if that's your intention, then you need to revise that intention and correct that intention during this month of Ramadan while it's easy for you to do so and then ask Allah for his tawfiq going forward. No doubt all of us do more in Ramadan than we would do outside. I don't doubt that for a second. But ultimately, we don't want to have that intention that I'm doing something just for a few days. Rather, I'm doing something and inshallah, I'm going to continue in some form or another. Like fasting, I'm not going to fast every single day now for the rest of the year. But inshallah, I'm going to continue the habit of fasting. I might not manage to pray the same length of prayer that I would pray in the night in Ramadan. I'm going to try to pray the night prayer outside of Ramadan as well. I might not manage to necessarily uh, give as much charity and be as generous as I was in Ramadan, but I'm going to try and keep that generosity going. That's the kind of mentality that a person should have by the permission of Allah. And all of that is only from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only from Allah's tawfiq and the, the, the success that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, I guess, is what Allah Azawajal made easy for me to mention in the time that I had. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made easy for me to mention in, in the time that was allocated. I think we might have five or ten minutes for questions. Uh, I can't actually see your comments or questions, but I'm going to ask. Uh, Rahman, you can read them out to me, please.
Did we have any questions? Are you able to see the questions? Yep. No. Is it preferable to do tilawa only or only or give a portion of time for tilawa tafsir and hikmah? So is it preferable to only recite the Quran in Ramadan or is it also preferable to set some time aside for uh, al-hifth and al-tafsir? The month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran and it's well known that the believer's relationship with the Quran is a multifaceted relationship. It's a relationship that has more than one face to it. So there is the aspect of tilawa, recitation, there is the aspect of hifth, memorization, there is the aspect of tadabbur, thinking and reflecting and pondering, there is the aspect of uh, acting upon it, and there is the aspect of understanding what is intended from the words of Allah, the speech of Allah. So I believe all of these are valid in the month of Ramadan. Yes, from the, the guidance of the Salaf is they would increase in reciting the Quran in Ramadan. And I, I believe that should be done. I'm not saying that you shouldn't increase, but give some time also for to, to complete the benefit because tilawa on its own isn't going to get you that benefit by itself. Rather, a tilawa and give some time for a tadabbur, give some time for pondering, thinking, give some time to understand a little bit. If you have a program for memorization, keep it going in Ramadan. If you don't and you want to start one, start one in Ramadan because this is the, t the best time to start something, right? The, we said the shayateen are chained, the doors of Jannah open, the mercy of Allah. It's the chance for you to start the program for memorization, inshallah. So I believe that it's a time for all of those things, but definitely increasing in, in recitation is, is definitely from the sunnah in, in Ramadan. I'm with my friend in this Ramadan. We both make jama'ah. When it comes to tar taraweeh, we both pray separate just to prolong our salah. With this, can we get the same reward of praying the whole night? Well, my advice to you is not, it's not wrong for you to pray separately. But my advice to you is if, if you're not able, as I understand it right now, the masajid are not going to be open for taraweeh, at least in the UK. I'm, I'm in the UK right now. And as I understand, the same situation is in Dubai right now that the masajid are not open for taraweeh. So in that case, I think that you should follow the sunnah of the Muslims and pray in your small jama'ah, pray taraweeh in your jama'ah. Because Al Imam Ahmed was asked about a person who has a choice between praying in the jama'ah or praying by themselves at night. He said, Sunnatul Muslimin ahabbu ilay. The sunnah of the Muslims is more beloved to me. Get the people together and pray in the jama'ah. Now obviously it might not be possible with the restrictions to have a big jama'ah, but even in your house, if you can have a small jama'ah, I believe this is more deserving than praying by yourself. But there is no harm in you joining between those two things, inshallah, i.e. you pray in the jama'ah up to a point, and you finish, you start together, you finish together, and then if anyone wants to pray nawafil after that voluntary prayers, I don't see any harm in that, inshallah ta'ala, and I don't think that that is necessarily contradictory to what came from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and what the Salaf al-Salih, what they used to do. Nah. We know that we can hold Quran, the Qur'an in Taraweeh, but can we hold invocation book in Witr to mean Dua? Can we hold a book of Dua in, in Witr? Well, I don't advise this. I don't advise, I, I personally think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people go far from the Sunnah as it relates to Witr. A lot of people go far from the sunnah. So as it relates to witr, first of all, the Prophet ﷺ did not used to make dua in witr every single day. He didn't used to make uh, the qunut, uh, the dua in, in, in witr every single day. That's the first thing. The second thing is there is no sunnah for prolonging this dua like the people do. Where they make this dua 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and they bring du'as yani, that nobody ever heard before. No one ever saw before or heard before. And some of them are not even necessarily befitting or not even necessarily correct. Rather, it's enough for a person to make du'a in a short, what they know. 
And sometimes they can make dua in witr and sometimes they don't have to make dua in witr. And they can miss it out at least one or two nights in Ramadan, miss it out. Maybe not in the last 10 nights, maybe just one or two nights you can miss it out. Just to, you know, for the sake of not, not, implement, not doing something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do. And as for these long du'as and people, you know, subhanAllah, it's almost like when they used to hire people in Jahiliyyah to wail. They used to hire people to wail. You know, they used to hire a woman to scream at the top of her voice. SubhanAllah, even the witr in some places has become like this. That you literally, they literally bring an imam because the imam is known for wailing in the witr. That's what he's known for. That this is closer to being a bid'ah. And Allah Azza wa knows best. We don't know anything from this, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu or from the Salaf al-Salih, from the Imams of Islam, that this you know really long, prolonged witr and and you know the the exaggeration in it and so on. Rather, what we think is that a person should limit themselves to what they know from the du'a. They should make du'a what is easy for them without deliberately making it really, really long, and they should make it what is easy for them with what the du'as that they know. And if the person doesn't know the du'a that the Prophet ﷺ taught in witr, Allahumma hatini fi man hadayt wa afini fi man afayt, then the person perhaps can, inshallah, uh, they can learn this during the day and inshallah they can implement it. And at least inshallah a person can learn this, some small du'as, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. And what is easy for them, inshallah. So this is what I would advise regarding the witr. So I wouldn't necessarily advise taking a dua book like that. I think, inshallah, you can make dua at other times. Like, for example, in the gap between the taraweeh, you can make dua, inshallah. You can make dua in your tashahud. If you want to read from a book of dua, you can read from it outside of the time of the prayer. I think this is better. So that we just get out of this habit, this negative habit people have about the witr which is sometimes, you know, it's, it's not befitting and it's not right and it's not befitting and it's not from the sunnah. No. How do we save from sins, major and minor, during the Ramadan and after it? How do we feel that Allah is pleased with us and our ibadah are being accepted? Hmm. So this is a difficult question. How do we keep away from sin? How do we keep away from sin, major and minor? So this is a big question. It's actually a topic for a whole lecture. So I, I don't really, I, I don't want to necessarily go into the entire like a lecture in it. But I just want to highlight a few points. First of all, you need to know what the sins are. What's sinful? You need to have knowledge in Islam. And we can take this from the hadith of Hudayfa. Radiyallahu an kana nasu yas'aluna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anil khayr wa kuntu as'aluhu anil sharr makhafata ayyudrikani. The people, they used to ask the Prophet ﷺ about good. And I used to ask him about evil so that it didn't happen to me. So thinking about that, that's knowledge. And by preventing your soul from its desires and getting control of your soul, but realizing that you are going to fall into sins. You can't necessarily keep away from all sins. You are going to fall into sins. And that's where you need a tawbah wal istighfar. The Prophet ﷺ used to make istighfar 70 times in the day. So this is something, inshallah ta'ala, uh, which is, is something that it will happen. It's going to happen. That you're going to uh, fall into some sins. You're going to slip up. That's why you need a tawbah and al istighfar. But definitely, I would say uh, knowledge is a big thing. Knowledge of Allah to know who you're disobeying. Knowledge of what the sins are, what the major sins are, the minor sins are, so that you don't fall into them. It's narrated from some of the Salaf Rahimahumullah Ta'ala Rahimahum Ta that they used to say that uh, ghiba, backbiting, it, it tears your fast into shreds and istighfar patches it up. And they used to say, فَمَنْ إِسْتَطَعَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ لَا يَأْتِيَ بِصَوْمٍ مُخَرَّقٍ فَلْيَفْعَلْ Whoever doesn't, if whoever's able not to come with a fast that's been ripped into shreds, let him do it, i.e. The person, the danger of backbiting, you know, when you're fasting. But if you don't know what backbiting is and you don't know that it's mentioning about your brother what they don't like, even if it's true or, or when it's true, then a person might fall into it and not even realize that they're falling into it. So definitely uh, a person needs to get that knowledge. And then when they get that knowledge, they need to prevent their soul from its desires. Inna nafsa la ammaratun bisu. The soul is always going off on a 
on a tangent going the wrong way and that those desires they, that that pushes the soul you know towards what it what is bad for it so controlling the nafs and controlling uh, the soul as for how we know our deeds have been accepted then the reality is we don't know that our deeds have been accepted and that's why it's narrated from some of the early generations that they the people they used to say that they used to spend the first six months of the year asking Allah to make them reach Ramadan and the last six months asking Allah to accept it from them. They used to spend six months making dua, Allahumma ballighna Ramadan, or Allah give us the ability to reach Ramadan. And then they used to spend the next six months saying, Rabbana taqabbal minna, oh Allah accept it from us. But one of the signs that you have had something accepted, and it's not a guarantee, but it's a, an ishara, a sign or an indication, that something from you has been accepted is that the statement that of Allah Azza wa Jalla Yazidu Allahu Ladi Nahtada Huda. Allah gives an increase in guidance to those who are guided. Allah gives more guidance. In other words, you do a good deed and Allah gives you the ability to do another one. You do a good deed, Allah gives you the ability to do another one. So if you see from yourself that in Ramadan you you know you finish your prayer, you're praying another one. You finish your fast, you, you, you want to fast another one. You finish giving charity, you want to give some more, and so on. Then this is a sign, inshallah, that, that you, uh, your deeds have been accepted by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. But a person should always be fearful. Like Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ Those people who give what they give and their hearts are trembling out of a fear that it hasn't been accepted for them, knowing that they will be returning to their Lord Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think we'll do maybe just one or two more because I do have another class coming up right now on my tafsir, my regular tafsir class, so I have to be a bit careful about that timing. If I miss one rakah after all, we, we need to do I need to repeat two rakah again or just pray pray one rakah to complete two rakah? If I miss one rakah after all, no, you only need to stand up and make one more. Like example, if if you're praying in a jama'ah, let's say in your house you got a little jama'ah going and you came late and you didn't catch the raka'ah, you didn't catch subhana rabbi al Azim. So now you are missing one. You can stand up after the imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You stand up and make up the one and then you can join the imam again for the next two, inshallah. Now, I hope that made sense. As the Prophet never prayed more than 11. Does this include two rakah of sunnah rawatib or is it apart from fard? It's apart from fard, you used to pray only 11. I mean, do we have to count two rakah sunnah or rawatib separately? The statement the Prophet never prayed more than 11, this refers to qiyamul layl and a tahajjud and a taraweeh. It doesn't refer to the fard prayers, it doesn't refer to the sunnah prayers, it doesn't refer to the ratiba prayers, it refers to the prayers at night. That the Prophet ﷺ at night, he never prayed more than 11 or it said 13 raka'at. And the way that that is counted is 8 raka'at of taraweeh or tahajjud or qiyamul layl. And there's no real difference between those three in the sense that they're all the same prayer. Taraweeh is prayed in the jama'ah at the early part of the night and the others are more likely prayed on the person on their own. but that they are basically essentially the same prayer. The Prophet have never prayed more than eight, and it said that the two raka'at of Isha is counted if you make it ten, and it said the two raka'at of, of the Shafa and the Witr is counted to make it thirteen. Ultimately, it means eight raka'at of Taraweeh plus either the two raka'at after Isha or the two raka'at of uh, Shafa and then the Witr. And or two rakat after the witr as the Prophet ﷺ would pray sometimes. But he would typically, his night prayer was eight rakat. However, I don't see any harm in a person praying more than that. And that is alayhi amal salaf The salaf al-salih rahimahumullah ta'ala, the righteous predecessors, they did not understand to limit this to eight rakat, in my opinion. And some of the scholars said that, some of the scholars said you must limit it to eight rakat or ten rakat. Some of them said you have to limit it. But, but I, I think if you look at the actions of the Salaf al-Salih, the righteous predecessors from you know, the, 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 the Imams of Islam and the, the Tabi'een and those who followed them in good, I don't think you see any evidence in it or that they understood 
to limit it like that. Rather, they prayed whatever the Imam prayed. Whoever prays starts with the Imam and finishes with the Imam. It's, it's written for him that he prayed the whole night. And if they wanted to add some prayers after that, they would add some prayers after that. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, inshallah ta'ala. You can hold a mushaf in taraweeh if you, there's a need for it. If there's a need for it. Like for example, you want to hold it so you can read more of the Qur'an or you're correcting the Imam. I don't think everyone should be holding the mushaf. I heard our Shaykh Sheikh Abdul Mursin Abbad, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, I heard him say that this is not a good thing. I heard him, he, he disliked this, that all the people standing in taraweeh and everyone is holding a mushaf. And he, he had some harsh words about it. He said it's against the sunnah of putting your hand on your chest and so on. But if there's a need for it, like you're the imam and you want to read from the mushaf or you are correcting the imam, the imam is reading from hifth and you're correcting the imam, then inshallah there's no harm in this. And if it's from the mobile phone, as long as the mobile phone is switched off and there are no distractions on it. Like I don't like that the person is using the phone and then the messages come and they're like, oh, okay, Abdullah messaged me, let me get back to him in five minutes. Oh, okay, I'll... Uh, reply and pray like you know you want it to be completely switched off with just the mushaf on it then inshallah there's no harm in that inshallah when there is a need for it let there be a need for it though not the case like it's a situation where people like everyone in the saf has a mushaf uh, because we heard some of our mashaykh they dislike this uh, action of people for everyone to be holding the mushaf so inshallah ta'ala one more question and it's the absolute last one inshallah we we're going to stop there and can it be done in one's own language? A person can supplicate in the sujood. Uh, the, pers- the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us, he said, "فَأَمَّا السُّجُودُ فَأَكْثِرُ فِيهِ مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, "As for sujood, make lots of du'a in it, and that dictates that you make du'a that is not just the fixed du'a. You make your own du'a. Also in the tashahud after you finish." Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahya wa al-mamat wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-dajjal Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said فَلْيَتَخَيَّرْ مِنَ الدُّعَاءَ أَعْجَبَهُ أَعْجَبَهُ إِلَيْهِ Let him choose, or كما قال, he said, let him choose the dua that is the most beloved to him. So, uh, for sure a person can make dua. I asked Shaykh Abdul Razak al-Badr, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, I asked him that Shaykh uh, about the dua, should our du'a be like as from our own, we just make our own du'a? Or should we stick to the du'a of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And I asked him, is it required for us? And he said that a person should always try, I'm going to paraphrase what he said, we should always try to stick to the du'as that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. But if we don't find what we need in that du'a, then we can, there's no harm in adding something in there. And there's no harm in making du'a in your own language. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala said, However, it is better that you stick to the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ in Arabic where you can, where you can, and when you don't find a du'a for it, there is no harm in you mentioning in your own language, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Or for the tafsir class, I don't know. Is this if there are more links? If there is, if this conference is continuing today from Dar uh, from uh, Dar al Bir and the Islamic Information Center, then I don't want you guys to log off that and come to my tafsir class, but. If there is no more lectures for this evening and you would like to join that class, you can find it on my YouTube channel. So you just go to youtube.com forward slash Muhammad Tim, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D-T-I-M. And inshallah, there is the tafsir class is starting in just a few moments, inshallah. Um, we scheduled it for, I think, uh, 7.45 UK time, which is, nine, uh, which is uh, 7.45 UK time, which is 10.45 Dubai time, I think. So inshallah, anyways, it's starting now in a few moments on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Muhammad Tim. But if the lectures are continuing from IIC, then I would request that you stay for those lectures, inshallah, because it's not befitting when you start joining a conference and you attend the lectures, you should attend all of them, inshallah. But if this is the last lecture and you want to join the tafsir class, you're more than welcome. Barakallahu feekum. That's what Allah made easy for me to mention. And Allah Jalla fi ula knows best. والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين